In July 1947, a flying object crashed close to Roswell, New Mexico. Initially, the Army claimed to have had a flying disc in their possession, but 24 hours later, they modified their story, claiming that it was actually an experimental high-altitude weather balloon being utilized by the covert U.S. military Air Force instead. Yet, was it? According to reports from the 1970s and 1980s, the military was engaged in collecting alien spacecraft and conducting autopsies on the bodies of aliens found at the crash site. So, what are they really hiding? Today, we're discussing the infamous 1947 Roswell Incident. Let's go back to July 1947. We're south of Corona in New Mexico. A rancher named Mac Brazel and his son drove out to check on his cows after a severe storm had swept through the area. As he was going about his day, he spotted what looked to be a long, shallow hole in the ground with scraps of silver, metal-like debris covering up the landscape. Upon closer inspection, the debris appeared to be wreckage of some kind, made up of what looked to be rubber strips, tinfoil, and some tough metallic fabric that was cold to the touch. Matt collected all the debris, loaded it into his truck, and drove back wondering what to make of it. Also wondering who, if anyone, needed to know about his findings. Days later, Mac headed down to Roswell and delivered the debris to the local sheriff's office, where he met with Deputy George Wilcox. Wilcox, not knowing what to make of the find, contacted the local Roswell Air Base commander, Colonel Blanchard. The report of the debris eventually made its way up the food chain until it reached the desk of General Roger W. Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force in Fort Worth, Texas. Within hours, the area where Mac had made the find had been sealed off and military personnel began foraging the area, looking for remnants that had been missed. The next day, local papers released a statement made by Blanchard about the recovery of an unidentified flying object. The article included confirmation by Roswell Army Airfield Intelligence Officer Major Marcel that an unknown disc over five times the size of the Sheriff's Office was discovered on a ranch in Roswell. The article described the wreckage as being made up of shiny, almost black metal that was oval in shape and contained a glowing light inside. The article finished by saying that it was unknown whether the UFO contained any extraterrestrial life forms. After the article was released, many locals came forward to the sheriff's office describing how on the night before Mac discovered the debris, they had seen a glowing saucer flying through the air and traveling almost 500 miles per hour. Panic rose throughout Roswell and the surrounding areas. In the weeks before the crash, many had spotted unusual occurrences in the night sky and the confirmation of a UFO being found gave rise to fears that alien life forms were navigating the area looking to attack. The area quickly succumbed to fear and chaos, and within hours of the article being released, it was quickly withdrawn and replaced with a weather balloon cover-up, the one we're all too familiar with to this day. But over the years, various reports and witness accounts have been released that have given rise to New Age ufologists who believe that the original report was true. That on that fateful July night, an alien spacecraft crashed in a freak storm near Roswell, and that the unidentifiable metal wasn't the only thing collected from the crash site. One of the witnesses who have spoken up throughout the years since the cover-up was funeral home mortician, Glenn Dennis. On the day the wreckage was brought to the attention of the authorities, Glenn received a call from the Roswell Army Airfield base asking if he had any spare caskets. Questioning if there had been some kind of accident, Glenn was simply told that they needed as many hermetically sealed three to four foot caskets as they could get. Glenn told the commander that he had one on display and one in storage, but was pushed on if and when he could get more. Puzzled by the call, Glenn got to work contacting suppliers in order to fulfill the request. When hours later, he received yet another call from the base. This time, he was asked how to best store a body and what chemicals were used in embalming fluid. When Dennis explained, he was asked if the chemicals would change the chemical composition of a corpse. Having enough of the secrets and hushed phone calls, Dennis bluntly asked what on earth was going on and was simply told, we're just having a meeting here to see if we ever have an epidemic, what we have on hand. But why the rush? 
Later that day, Dennis responded to a job to transport an injured airman to a hospital on base. As he arrived, he noticed a concerning amount of old field ambulances stationed outside. Dennis peered into one of the doors that was left slightly ajar and saw something he could only describe as a shiny, sleek, metal-loving being with pink and black purple colorings. Whatever it was, it wasn't human. After delivering the injured airman, Dennis waited for the job to be approved for payment. And whilst he was standing around, he noticed the base hospital becoming busier and busier. Heading over to the doctor's lounge, he asked if there had been some sort of crash that the funeral home should be prepared for. An older Air Force official told him to not take a step further and ordered for Dennis to be manually escorted off the base. As he was leaving, he passed by a nurse he was friendly with who had a mask on her face and was drained of color. All she could say was, get the hell out of here. The next day, Dennis met with the still anonymous nurse at a coffee shop and she recounted the events of the previous day to him. Dennis sat in shock as the nurse told him how strange otherworldly creatures had been brought to the hospital. The nurse drew out what they looked like on a napkin. Small bodies, large heads with glassy white eyes, and four fingers with what looked like suction cups on the end. Dennis's worst fears were realized when the original news report of the incident was released. That day, he had been mere feet away from an array of dying alien species. In the years after the initial press release and retraction took place, the man responsible, press relations officer Walter Hott, faced public ridicule and embarrassment for supposedly getting it so wrong. How could someone mistake a weather balloon for a UFO? Hott knew better than to give rise to public opinion, and instead, when he was getting his affairs in order, as he grew older, he hatched a plan. Hott wrote and signed a written affidavit to be published after his death, which spoke about the real events of Roswell. When the document was published, it was revealed that the writings of the late Hot, that the weather balloon story, had been a cover-up the entire time. In it, Hot detailed not only the alien spacecraft that was found, but the bodies in the wreckage too. Hot described the UFO and the aliens inside as being something not of this earth. In 1995, Ray Santilli, a London-based TV and music producer, released footage he claimed to have obtained from a former military soldier stationed at Roswell. The infamous 17-minute long alien autopsy alleges to be footage secretly taken in the Roswell Air Base days after the wreckage was found. In the shaky black and white clip, you can see the figure of a 5-foot-tall humanoid-type creature with grayish skin, a large head and large glassy black eyes. The same description as what Dennis drew all those years before. A sizable wound is shown on the alien's lower right leg. Two doctors in hazmat gear start the autopsy by slicing into the body and looking it over. It becomes pretty gory. The brain is sliced open and the internal organs are removed. In 2006, after facing mounting pressure, Santilli came forward and admitted the footage was fake and that the alien was just a dummy. But he didn't call what he did a hoax. Instead, Santilli claimed that the footage received was a replica of an actual alien autopsy he had watched that came to him in the same form from an anonymous military base worker in Roswell. Santilli claimed that the original tape had deteriorated, so he had decided to show the world the next best thing, a recreation painstakingly made with frame-by-frame -frame accuracy. So, what do you think? With mounting evidence, witness testimonies, and even deathbed confessions. How convinced are you that the facts and fiction of the events of the 1947 Roswell crash really are what they seem?